Hey everybody, Adam here. Hope everyone is doing well. So, using aluminum cans as insulation. We've got a building science experiment here. Uh, if you like these science experiments, please like and comment on the video and I will keep them coming. But uh, let's get straight into it. So first I'm going to just run over the basic assembly. Uh, then I will talk about what insulation actually is how I got here, and then I'll go over some more minute but still important details. So let's start with the basic assembly. It's quite simple actually. We've got 5 8 plywood right here. In between that plywood and the studs, we've got this polyethylene foam that's 16th of an inch, R1, so the package says. We'll just run with it. Remember, our value is additive, so every little bit we can add to the assembly counts. Then we have more of this foam going across the plywood, stapled to the studs, so we're not penetrating through our sheathing. This is kind of like cheats uh, continuous insulation. It's not like truly continuous, but it's pretty close. Then we have cans. Cans are stacked like tubes, and two rows just happens to fit pretty good inside of a, uh, pretty well, I should say, inside of, uh, sorry, I'm a grammar Nazi, inside of the ca cavity. And then we have more of that foam going all the way across the studs and the cavities, and that really is continuous insulation on the interior side. So now let's talk about what insulation really is and how I got here. So over here, I've got a strip of polyisocyanurate. This is a very good insulator. Uh, on one side, we've got this foil face, which is a radiant barrier and a water barrier. On the other side, we've got this plastic membrane, which is just a water barrier, because you really don't want this stuff to get wet. And then in the center here, we've got the actual polyiso, the foam. And you know, that is the insulation. So how does it work? What is it doing? All it really does is it just holds air still. That's all that any insulation actually does. Fiberglass, stone wool, cellulose, denim, spray foam. It's just holding air still. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it because the R value of trapped air, like the air inside of this empty bottle, for example, that's about R3.6 per inch. The R value of most insulation materials ranges between 3.5 to 4 per inch. So pretty much the same because all it's doing is holding air. That's where you're really getting your thermal resistance. If you look closely at this polyiso, all these tiny little nooks and crannies and holes in it, that's trapping up air. So that's it. Now, with this in mind, let's take a look at these cavities. So if we can get these cavities pretty airtight so that air is really trapped in there, that alone could take us up with a two by six cavity, that alone could take us up to pretty close to R20. Now we could round down and say, uh, maybe it's only R3 per inch. Well, that's still gonna get us over R15, uh, five and a half inch depth. That's uh, what, R16 uh, and a half, if we round down to three. That's still pretty good. Now check out my video right before this one, the one I just uploaded most recently. Uh, I go over my air sealing de details for the inside, but it's basically just a combination of tape, foam, and glue. So now that we understand what's going on with that, let's come back over to here and break down some more of the science happening here. So we've got the foam, which is acting in some areas, it's acting as an air seal where it's clamped between materials and it's also an, an insulating material. Then we have our aluminum cans these are primarily functioning as a radiant barrier. So they're scattering and diffusing infrared radiation. And then we have more of that foam doing the same thing on 
this side, the interior side, creating an air seal around the studs and adding some insulation to the assembly. Now, why not just have an empty airtight cavity if that's what's really doing the insulating? Well, one reason you don't wanna do that is for acoustical purposes. Uh, that's gonna create bad acoustics. If, if the cavity is just completely empty, you've just made a drum. So you really wanna put something in the cavity to reduce sound transmission and echoes. Another reason to fill the cavity, even if we have air trapped in there, is it's not just about trapping air. We want to restrict the air's movement, its convection, air buoyancy. Air will naturally rise up and down, fall, you know, rise and fall up and down. That movement is what allows the air to change temperature, which is what we don't want. So the more stuff we can stuff into the cavity, the more we're going to restrict the flow of the air in addition to trapping it. Again, it's, it's about holding the air still. So these cans, they're taking up volume and displacing air from the cavity. They're also restricting the movement of air. Air will not be able to flow up and down as easily because these cans are in the way and the cans have air in them, right? Air can get in through those tiny openings. But then when I put another can on top of it and kind of slot it in that groove, it's gonna be pretty difficult for uh, the air to move in and out of the can. That's gonna become a much slower process. So that's why we don't just leave the cavities open. Now, let's take a look over here. Let me grab my temperature gun, as I like to call it, my infrared thermometer take some readings here, take some deltas. Now, whenever I say delta, I just mean the difference between temperatures, that's all. So we'll start with the open cavity. Okay. All right, 67, oh, 66.7.5. Okay, about 66.7. Move over here to the closed cavity, the filled cavity, I should say. Okay, so we've got a delta 57.7. So we've got a delta of, what's that, about nine. Now check this out. Let's go over to the studs. And we see an even bigger drop. Now, why are the studs outperforming the cavities. That really shouldn't happen. They should be acting as a thermal bridge. A couple of explanations. Number one is I've got this foam on the backside and the front side of the stud, so I've nullified it as a heat conductor. Now it's just insulation and thermal mass. Wood has a little bit of both. It's got a little bit of an R value, R1.4 per inch of soft wood, and it's got a little bit of thermal mass. Nothing like concrete, but it can store some heat and slowly transfer that heat. So by putting the foam on both sides of it and eliminating the conductivity, I actually have a really good insulating material now. As for the cavity, a mistake, I guess you could say I made over here, was uh, initially because the cans are, they're pretty loose in the cavity. They're not crammed in there and they're pushed up tightly against the materials. Uh, I thought if I just did plywood, cans, foam, no foam on the back side of the cans, that would be fine. What I've now discovered is that even though only a tiny little bit of the surface of some of those cans is touching the plywood, it's still enough to make the cans act as a heat conductor. And so that's why it's really important that you get foam on both sides of the cans so that they're not conducting any heat they're only acting as a radiant barrier. It's also important whenever we're dealing with radiant barriers that we've got some open air space around the radiant barrier or else it won't function as a radiant barrier. It has to be able to reflect that infrared energy away to somewhere instead of conducting it to something. Now, 
let's talk a little bit more about the foam because that's a major player in this whole assembly. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting, more than you might realize. So yeah, it's, it's, it's giving us some air sealing and it's creating that thermal break. It's, it's killing the thermal bridging effect between materials. Super important. But again, it's also, especially on this interior side, it's continuous insulation. Now, most homes in America, in fact, probably most homes in the whole world, don't have any continuous insulation, which means lots of thermal bridging. So in my opinion, any amount of continuous insulation you can add to your assembly, probably more important than what you're sticking in the cavities. Again, this foam, it's rated at R1, R values additive. So if I double it, triple it, quadruple it, R2, R3, R4, I'll just go ahead and say this is something like continuous R1.5 insulation across the interior of the assembly. Again, most homes don't have any, so that's a huge, huge step up. The foam is also holding the cans in place, not entirely. I mean, it's the cans stack pretty well on their own and they're light as a feather, but it is preventing them from just falling out of the cavity. The foam is also giving us an acoustic benefit. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? Just go over here and... Sort of a no-brainer. So it's, it's reducing sound vibrations, sound transmission which is very important unless you like uh, hearing the noise of all your neighbors. Now, let me explain how I got all of these cans. There's probably a thousand something here. And then we'll also talk about some more properties that the cans have. So probably four years ago-ish, I started saving all of our aluminum cans. We don't get trash pickup in this area and I don't have, there's no place uh, nearby where I can recycle aluminum. So I just started to save them. Aluminum is actually a, a valuable and finite metal, so I don't like just chucking it in a landfill. So I started to just bag them up in these big trash bags. And over here, uh, my shipping container is just full of bags like that. I, who knows how many thousands I have. They accumulate quite quickly, you'd be surprised. So. I drink a lot of club soda and beer. My wife also drinks a good amount of club soda, a little bit of beer here and there. So in one week, we accumulate anywhere from like 30 to 40 cans on average. It's really not that many drinks per day if you, if you break it down. So, you know, four or five cans, four or five drinks a day, you know, it's four or five cans a day. It's about, you know, 35 cans a week. It adds up quickly. Now, I don't think it's realistic for most people to do an entire house <laughs> like this, because I mean, like tens of thousands of cans. Uh, I'm just concentrating on this one small area for now. But tiny houses, attics, garage, uh, you know, shed. I can think of a lot of small spaces where you could implement this, and you could accumulate the cans pretty quickly for a small area. Uh, save your own, ask your friends, family, neighbors. Most people will be happy to give you their cans. I mean, why would they even care? Now, they will think you're a weirdo, but that's okay because being a weirdo is fun. I've been a weirdo my whole life. It's been a pretty good time. So be a weirdo, get some cans, try it for yourself. On to other properties the cans have that actually give them a leg up on many other insulating materials. So they're entirely water resistant. They won't be damaged by water. They're never going to rust. Uh, nothing's going to eat them. They're completely non-combustible. Now, I won't say they're fireproof because nothing's really fireproof, but they're not going to catch on fire. And they really last forever, especially in a cavity like this. 100 years from now, these cans are going to be exactly the same, whereas other materials like this polyiso, for example, it's gonna degrade over time. All other insulating materials have a lifespan. You know, so this uh, right now, well, not probably not even anymore. I mean, right out of the factory, it's got some gas that's, that's trapped in those little pockets in it, just the way it's made, uh, which is something that gives it that really high R value. It's, it's close to about R6 per inch. But over time, 
those gases are going to escape. It's going to kind of start to break down and that's going to drop to, you know, R5 and a half, R5, and it might just kind of keep going down and down and down and down a little bit over the decades. And it won't last forever. The cans, they're staying the same. Now, I think, well, I always say this, I always say that, I think I covered everything. Something I should address, uh, you know, I mentioned this foam is polyethylene. So uh, don't get that too confused with uh, when people say, um, you know, five mil poly, six mil poly, four mil poly, the stuff that goes under a slab or in a wall assembly to create a vapor barrier. Those are sheets of polyethylene, right? So it's the same plastic, but it's a different material. Those are solid sheets of plastic. Those are a vapor barrier. Those of you who follow me, you know that for this high desert climate or really any desert climate, I advocate against vapor barriers. We don't need them and you could accidentally do more harm than good. So just don't use them. Now I'm not breaking my own rule here with this polyethylene foam because it's not solid sheets of polyplastic. Even though it's the same plastic, it's a foam. It's pretty airtight, it's pretty watertight, but it's vapor permeable. Water in the vapor form can diffuse through it, especially the way I have it kind of shingled here with all these open joints. It's not sealed completely. And same goes for the cans. If these cans were solid sheets of aluminum foil and they were really, you know, glued in there, sealing the whole thing up, they'd be a vapor barrier. And I, I don't want that. But because they're, you know, individual cans, they've got a lot of air space around them, they're not at all acting like a vapor barrier. Now, all of the materials in this assembly, the plywood, the studs, etc., they're all vapor retarders. They will slow the diffusion of vapor, but they're not going to completely block it and perhaps accidentally trap moisture in the wall. Now, with that said, I think I really have covered everything. Oh, a little point I want to make about the deltas uh, we looked at earlier. When you're taking readings like that, they're going to change across the course of the day. You're never going to get the exact same reading every single time because it takes time for heat to transfer through the assembly. So that's well, about noon right now. If I came back at 3 or 4 p.m., uh, my deltas would probably be smaller because there's been more time for that heat to move through the wall assembly. So you're gonna get the widest reading early in the day, you're usually gonna get the narrowest reading later in the day, and you just sort of have to find an average. 